Sunday night, 8 p.m. And we are back with another great show live with another hot topic, which is whether or not natural substances can help you with endometriosis. So uh, going along with our natural theme, last week we did uh, natural substances that help with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so I thought I'd continue that this week with endo, another big issue in the fertility world, and obviously a hot button topic for a lot of our viewers. So uh, we're going to bring that to you tonight. Everybody's jumping on board. Make sure you uh, grab some munchies so you can stay with us for a while. First uh, 15, 20 minutes of the show is always a review of the studies or data. And then uh, after that, we do the rest of the time just spent answering your questions live. And you can ask us pretty much anything. Some of the patients have actually, or, or viewers have actually started asking us questions ahead of the show. So you can do that through Instagram. And uh, we're more than willing to uh, go through any of those questions with you. So I uh, look forward to answering all those questions tonight. Thanks all for joining us. We're excited to have you on board. And uh, we'll get started in a few minutes. Hopefully everybody's had a good week. Today seemed to be Twins Day for us. So I did uh, four ultrasounds, all dating ultrasounds with twins, 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 twins. So uh told a lot of people they needed bigger homes. I'm sure I've made several real estate agents happy and uh, really amazing outcomes. These were just uh, IUI except for one, uh, one or two IVF cycles we had done. So um, very, very exciting news. And uh, one of my very favorite patients we've had for several years who tried for a long time to use her own eggs, but age was definitely a very significant factor for her, finally used the donor. And uh, we told her today on first try, she was positive. So we are still keeping our outstanding success rate with donors. Very excited for her, uh, very amazing outcome. And she is uh, super pumped. And I'm pretty sure based on the beta, she's got twins too. So uh, very, very nice outcome for her and her partner. Um, very excited for her. And uh, that should be an amazing uh, journey and story for them as well. So all, uh, all good news all around today. Um, pretty much everybody did very well. So it was an exciting day for us. Busy day, but exciting day. Okay, so um, it looks like there's still some folks joining us. I see some of our friends on board for the show as well. Um, so tonight's topic I thought I'd pick because obviously a lot of people are interested in taking a natural approach. Uh, I'm all about doing natural approaches to things. That's why we have Jennifer Strong, our naturopath, with us at all times. And uh, Jen's an amazing adjunct to our, our program. She's done a lot of really helpful, great things for us. And I think we owe a lot of our success to her work and her efforts, in addition to all the other people that work with us, of course, our nurses in both locations, Sarnia and Windsor, all of our uh, associated staff, our psychologist, our social worker. Um, we have a nutritionist on board with us now. We even have an addiction specialist. And of course, our amazing embryology team, our uh, lab director, uh, all the nurses and associated staff here, an incredible office manager and business manager. So everybody here uh, has put in a huge amount of effort to make all of these dreams uh, come true for everyone. So thank you to all of you. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, as I said, the natural component of this with endometriosis is uh, important because people want to know not just what medications they can take, but what can they do on their own with supplements and so on uh, to help them. Endo in particular is a, a touchy subject for a lot of people. I've had women come in here with sort of the mindset ahead of time that they absolutely do not want any of the medications that are available, even simple things like birth control. They feel very strongly that based on their reading online, they should not take certain medications. Lupron seems to be sort of a, a big hot topic there. They only want to use, you know, natural products or other therapies. And many people believe that you can only have surgery for endo. It is true that endo can only be diagnosed by surgery and treatment with surgery, especially excisional surgery is very beneficial, but you can just ablate endo and it has almost an identical outcome. It does not have to be excised. Studies have shown that we've actually reviewed that on our show before. There's a 1% clinical difference in the outcome. So it really makes no difference at all. And you can also use multiple medications, birth control, Vizan, Fibristol, um, Lupron, Oralissa. There's all sorts of different agents that are available that actually will help. 
Many of them have side effects, especially Lupron, there's no question. But people come in here saying Lupron is the devil and Lupron is not the devil. For a lot of women, Lupron is what saves them from going crazy or having to take their uterus out when they still want to have children. So it's actually a very useful drug if used appropriately and in the right circumstances. But the question really is what can we do to make it better for you on a natural basis? So I pulled this article from July 2019 when it was received and it was actually published in November of 2019. It's in the European Journal of Obstetrics, Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Biology. Um, and uh, so it's an interesting article uh, looking at natural products, and they called it potential lead compounds for the treatment of endometriosis. Now, by no means is this exhaustive. I'm sure they didn't cover every single agent that's available. And if you want a, an example of some extra agents that are available, our video on YouTube on endometriosis, which was this big half hour production we did um, early in the uh, starting days of VRC, uh, has a lot of information on endo, including surgical videos, data, and we do review some of the natural topics and the, the data that was available up to that time. This is a much more in-depth article than what was available at that point, and so uh, this has even more information than it had before. Okay, so these authors did not perform their own study. They actually performed just a review of existing studies. So there's a lot of data to go through here. I'm probably going to bore you a little bit at times with just some of the scientific information, but there's one kind of overall arching theme to this, which is really critical that will come through, through. And that is, unfortunately, although there is a lot of what they call in vitro studies, and there are many evaluations of how endo affects animals, there is very, very little data looking at natural products effects on actual human outcomes. So there is nothing on live birth. There is nothing on, you know, endometrioma sizes. There is nothing on the outcomes of lesion sizes or recurrence rates or fertility outcomes and things like that. So in our system, and I searched through PubMed today, we have very, very little data that can be extrapolated from cell culture studies or animal models like mice and rats and so on to human studies. Now, they've taken human endometriosis cells, in many cases transplanted them into rats or mice, and then they're looking at them and saying, okay, the lesions get bigger or they get smaller or whatever the issues are. But they have very, very little that evaluates the outcomes in actual human beings or in surgical studies or in terms of live births and, and clinical implantation and pregnancy and miscarriage and so on. So I'm going to go through the data on what's available. I'll go through the different uh, products that are available. But keep in mind, there is very, very little human data. So while many of these products look promising, we're not actually going to be able to tell you ahead of time whether or not these work or do not work. So one of the first ones is curcumin. So curcumin is the active ingredient in turmeric, um, which is a common sort of spice or herb. And um, you can use that in your cooking and you can uh, actually take curcumin powder and it works uh, in an anti-inflammatory capacity very, very well. There are a lot of studies looking at the antimicrobial, antioxidant, and even anti-tumor properties of curcumin, and they do show significant benefits. So people said, well, if it's good in all these anti-inflammatory antioxidant roles, and even as an anti-tumor agent, would it be useful in endometriosis? So there have been studies looking at this in vitro, where they're looking at cell cultures, and there have been animal studies as well. So what they showed in uh, a large sort of review study was that there was a reductive effect on the progression and invasion of endometriotic cells. So these are endometriosis cells um, and on inflammation in animal models. So they said that the stromal cells, which are the cells in between the glands from endometriosis um, could be taken and put in with curcumin and you see a reduction in the chemical mediators of inflammation, which are called cytokines or chemokines, uh, and that many different pro protein molecules that are critical to that inflammatory cascade to initiating all of the adhesion formation, some of the things that lead to inflammation, 
probably some of the things that lead to interference with embryo implantation were all down-regulated or decreased, and it was in a dose-dependent manner. That's important because when it's dose-dependent, you know that it's the real deal because it means that it's an actual correlated response with the agent that you're administering. So it's not just that you gave it and something happened. It's that when you gave more, more happened. When you gave less, less happened, which means it's directly related to the agent you're using. So curcumin looked like it was really important. Some of these products are things you're probably bored to tears with. One's called STAT3, the other one's called JNK. These are phosphorylation products that can actually have an impact on your inflammatory cascade. Um, there's a bunch of other ones like uh, uh, NFK-alpha, uh, NFK-beta. Uh, uh, so there's a, a bunch of different products that can actually be affected. The next one they looked at was a uh, active component of ginseng called ginsenoside RF. So this is part of what you get from ginseng. It's very common in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, and there you've shown, again, a lot of immune and endocrine effects of using ginseng in the human uh, uh, realm. Um, there are clinical studies for this, not in relation to fertility, but in relation to many different things like cardiovascular health, um, sexual health, menopausal health, and so on. So the anti-inflammatory properties of ginsenoside have been examined, and they looked at taking surgically induced rat endometriosis, where they actually put endometriotic cells into rats, and then evaluated what happened to those uh, the implants of the cells because they can reopen a rat and look inside. Um, sorry to any of those of you who feel that's unethical. Um, and sorry to the rats. Uh, in any event, they did show that the volume of the endometriotic lesions um, was decreased after you got ginsenoside. So if you're taking these ginseng products, the amount of endometriotic lesions in the rats was reduced. Again, remember, this is not in humans, it's in rats, but it did show a decrease. They also, again, looked at the inflammatory cytokines and chemokines and again showed that these were decreased, especially expression of nerve growth factors, which are thought to mediate a lot of the pain that comes with your endometriosis. And so they're saying this may actually help reduce your pain, not just your inflammation and your infertility. So that has some promise. Again, we don't know anything about actual human studies in humans, but it does look like it may be beneficial in animal studies um, using human tissue in the animal. So very promising, but not hardcore data. Um, so there's one study looking at one patient, which is just called the case report. I don't think you can even really call it a study. It's a combination of Korean herbs. The only reason they included it here is because this patient had an endometrioma. Endometriomas are cysts of endometriosis in your ovary. They are notoriously bad because they do a lot of damage to your ovary. They can reduce the function of the ovary. They can reduce your follicle count, your responsiveness. They're very pro-inflammatory. They cause a lot of inflammation and adhesion formation. And if you leave them, they do damage. There's good data that shows that if you have an endometrioma, you're Follicular count goes down, your AMH goes down, the function of your ovary goes down. And when you remove them, it can be even worse if you're not careful in the surgery. So there's a lot of data out there showing endometriomas are really a very significant problem. The interesting thing with this study was they put a bunch of different um, agents together. I'm not even going to try and pronounce them. Um, I don't think anyone but a homeopathist could. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they've shown benefits in women that had menopause, inflammatory conditions, and even cancer. In this one particular patient, a 36-year-old woman with an endometrioma, it actually progressively shrank the endometrioma, and they showed that there was decrease in all of her symptoms, including pain, itching. I don't know why she had itching related to an endometrioma. Um, they men mentioned pudendal symptoms and even some of the inflammatory markers like the CA125 level. It's a protein we look at in your bloodstream that is associated with endometriosis in many cases and other forms of inflammation. All of these went down while this patient was using this. So that was really interesting. Um, so promising, no larger scale studies, but they suggested that this should be looked at. It's a bunch of different Korean uh, based uh, sort of homeopathy products. 
Um, alpha lipoic acid, uh, palmitolate amylomade, PEA, and myrrh uh, have also been looked at for endometriosis-associated pain. These were not fertility studies, but they were helpful for pain. And this was actually quite a large multi-center study done by DeLeo et al. And all three ingredients are known for being very anti-inflammatory, um, pro-suppression of inflammation, and good for pain relief. So they studied this in relation to endometriosis and showed that there was very good um, reduction in pain, although there was no change in the size of the cysts of endometriosis. So this actually was looked at in terms of the um, pa actual patients uh, because it was a clinical study. So they didn't show a reduction in the size of the endometrioma, but they did show that there was significant improvements in pain sexual function and pain with bleeding. So it's a good pain reliever, but no data on infertility. They also had another study which used NAC um, and acetylcysteine, which is a product we really favor and use a lot, um, in addition to alpha lipoic acid and bromelain. And again, those three together showed a reduction in endometriosis associated pain uh, during a six month trial. Again, none of these show that there is improvements in fertility, but they did improve the pain. And if you're improving your pain, you're reducing your inflammation. So hopefully that connection is there that you're then improving the results as far as the fertility is concerned. We've talked about melatonin on the show. We now use melatonin routinely in our fertility patients, as long as it doesn't put them to sleep, because obviously it does make you sleepy. Um, so melatonin has shown benefit in fertility. And here in studies of endometriosis, they've actually shown that um, receptors for melatonin are increased in the peritoneal tissue where you have endometriotic lesions, and it reduces some of the cell proliferation that comes along with endometriosis. So when endometriotic cells land in your pelvis and they stick, they start to grow and multiply, and the melatonin has actually demonstrated that it can reduce the impact of that and reduce the growth of the endometriotic cells and the, the number of cells that are growing. Now they did specify um, that that was observed even within 48 hours of taking the medication. So this is a relatively immediate effect. I would love to see this on a broader trial or a broader scale. It would be very interesting in particular to know if some of the benefits that are seen in fertility patients with melatonin are even more pronounced in the subgroups. So I may reach out to one of the authors that's done that study before with melatonin and fertility patients and say, hey, can you break it down based on subgroup analysis? Because maybe the endometriosis patients are the ones that are really benefiting from this. Omega-3 fatty acids you're all familiar with. Um, those are the DHA, the fish oils, for example. Um, we recommend that to a lot of our patients. It's very good at uh, managing inflammation. Um, I actually did uh, basic science research on omega-3 fatty acids and know that it alters uh, chemical markers of inflammation because those markers were associated with adhesion formation. And we were very successful in reducing those adhesion markers using a DHA and cell culture study. So this uh, study also looked at a few studies that had done that in regards to endometriosis. They said that omega-3 fatty acids did not help in terms of analgesia, so in terms of pain control, um, better than typical things like progesterone or Vizan or any of those things that we use. Um, but it still did help better than placebo in terms of pain. They did not, however, see an impact on fertility. It did not improve it. Um, and so they're not sure if it's helpful in regards to fertility or not. There are some studies that suggest it is. In these two larger studies, they suggested it was not. So that's still a question mark, but there's certainly no harm to taking omega-3 fatty acids. And again, anything that reduces inflammation is likely to end up with a benefit for those patients. There's another product I'd never heard of before called scutellarin. Um, this is a flavonoid, so kind of something that often comes out of uh, um, soy products. Uh, they did not show that this was beneficial uh, significantly um, in, uh, even in mice studies. They said further data is necessary, so probably not really useful to take that yet. 
Um, then they looked at Crochin, which is a carotenoid product um, and uh, comes out of saffron. Um, so saffron is very common in my, my culture. We use it all the time in our cooking, makes everything go yellowy orange. They put it in the rice. So it's got very strong anti-inflammatory uh, tendencies. They did show again in a mouse model uh, that proliferation and inflammation of uh, endometriotic cells uh, were reduced. They said the endometriotic lesions did not grow anymore once they were on this and it helped to reduce some of the growth factors that caused the endometriotic lesions to grow. So they said they actually were able to stop the growth. There was inhibition, although they didn't see it actually kill the endometriotic lesions. So again, you might be able to prevent it from getting worse, but there's no data that these um, agents actually cause death or regression of the endometriotic lesions. And again, keep in mind, this was in a mouse study. There's another product called Six Shogayol. I, I think that's the one, the, the way to pronounce it. Um, major active ingredient of dried ginger. So if you like dried ginger, this is your thing. Um, this was quite good because it showed a reduction in the size of the endometriotic lesions and significant down-regulation of some of the cytokines and chemokines. So Six Shogayol is uh, potentially helpful. Um, they found some effect on the formation of inflammation by lowering levels of some of the pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-1 beta and interleukin-6, which is very pro-inflammatory, um, and even prostaglandins, which cause a lot of pain that comes with your period and with your endometriosis. So again, all of these were fairly uh, favorable, but again, in rats, nothing in humans. The last one that they looked at was um, uh, taking isoflavone. So again, these are soy-based derivatives. Um, if you're big into taking soy, so those are the, the tofu products. Um, and they showed that it does inhibit uh, proliferation and growth again. Um, and they are very good at reducing inflammation, multiple markers, especially some of the ones that are involved in pain. Um, including COX-2 and uh, prostaglandin E2. So these are, again, markers of pain and inflammation, and these can all help reduce the amount of pain you get from your endometriotic lesion. Again, we don't know if this is helpful in terms of fertility specifically, but the theory would be if you're reducing pain, you're doing it via a mechanism that's reducing inflammation. If you're reducing the inflammation, maybe you're reducing the infertility. So... Do these natural substances work to help endometriotic patients in terms of fertility? We don't know. The truth is that it looks like the chemical components of this can actually help and they can reduce the uh, outcomes in terms of inflammation, in terms of pain, uh, and in terms of lesion growth. It looks like that's pretty ironclad now. There's a ton of data demonstrating that it's beneficial there, but there is not any real good data showing that the fertility outcomes, live birth, reduction in miscarriages, implantation, or uh, you know, clinical pregnancy are actually improved. We need a lot more work before we can get to that stage. Nevertheless, anything that reduces your inflammation is always good from a fertility perspective. So am I a believer? I think it's a fact these products have a lot of hope, but there is no data to demonstrate they are clinically active in terms of improving your fertility outcomes. So you still need to focus on some of the more traditional medications that we use, like Lupron, like Vizan, or taking surgical approaches, therapeutic approaches like that, and then use these to also help you as an adjunct. Never go into it just with these alone. It will probably not be sufficient to suppress all of what's going to happen to you if you have significant endometriosis. So thanks again for joining us for the Fertility Factor Fiction component of our show. Uh, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, like, share, comment. That's always really important for us. We're going to go to the questions now, and uh, don't hesitate to uh, put up your questions on any of the platforms on YouTube, on Facebook, uh, or on Instagram. We can get them all. So thanks again for joining us for that first part, and I guess I'll uh, start taking um, uh, questions right now. So uh, do you have questions there? Mm -hmm. Okay, fire away. I can take a few from there. I think people are just starting to ask here. And feel free to ask your questions. That's what we're here for. So thanks for all the likes. That's very lovely. Keep the likes coming. That's what keeps us on. 
That's what keeps this insanely bright light above me on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. First question. Or, uh, I don't know. Uh, is it okay to lie down on stomach if taking PIO shots until 12th week? Oh, yeah. So um, your sleeping position while you're pregnant is not important until you're past 20 weeks. And even then, the studies are actually equivocal. A study about two months ago said it didn't make a difference, but we still believe it does. And there are other studies that have shown it's concerning. So your inferior vena cava is your main vein in your body that brings blood back from your lower limbs and your lower body to your heart. Veins are low pressure, and anything that weighs on your vein will compress the vein, and then nothing can get through it. So if your uterus, which is at the level of the inferior vena cava around 20 weeks, flops down onto the inferior vena cava, it can occlude it. You're now reducing blood flow back to your heart. Your body looks at that and says, oh, I'm not getting enough going through to the heart. I need to redistribute the blood to the brain and the heart. It shuts off blood flow to your uterus and you can compromise a pregnancy that way. But you have to be past 20 weeks. I don't know of any woman that can sleep on her belly at 20 weeks, because you've got a fair size bulge there by then. So lying on your front early in a pregnancy, up to 12 weeks where the uterus hasn't even left your pelvis yet, absolutely not a problem. It's only a problem afterwards when you're past 20 weeks, if you're trying to do it past 20 weeks on your front, you're going to be a weeble. You're going to roll around. It's impossible. And if you're trying to lie flat on your back, you may compress the inferior vena cava. So always make sure you're either tilted one side or another. You will read stuff online that says you have to be left side down. That is not true. You just need to be on either side, minimum 30 degrees. So for any of you that have had a cesarean section, you know we put a wedge underneath your uh, right side to tilt you slightly left. That's just because of the position of the inferior vena cava, it's more to your right side. So we want to get your uterus off of that and so we rotate you slightly left. But when you're sleeping, it doesn't matter. As long as you're one side or the other, it's totally fine. There are no issues with that. You do not have to be totally sideways. Just don't be flat on your back after 20 weeks. So that's an easy one. Is it okay to use hand sanitizer while pregnant? Yes, please. During COVID, wash your hands constantly and use hand sanitizer. Um, there is some alcohol in hand sanitizer. The amount you're absorbing into your skin is pretty minimal, but uh, it's really important to avoid getting COVID. You are certainly better off using soap and water, um, and hand sanitizer can really dry out your hands, but there's no harm in using it, and we need it right now because of everything that's going on with COVID, so don't hesitate, use the hand sanitizer for sure. Uh, is it okay to continue four to five weeks, five times a week, boot camp classes, cardio, <laughs> strength, and no. no, definitely no boot camp. So uh, you cannot do high intensity uh, training when you are trying to get pregnant. Um, there are studies that show that that kind of intensity can cause miscarriages and be detrimental. Remember, if you're doing something like boot camp, you are taking the blood flow in your body and redirecting it. So you're redirecting it mainly to your muscles and to your heart, which means you're taking it away from the uterus and your ovaries and so on. So you cannot do boot camp when you're trying to get pregnant. Um, boot camp needs to be parked on the side. You can do light aerobics. You can do you know, a treadmill, although I'm not a fan of treadmills when you're pregnant, um, you know, stationary bike is fine, some, you know, maternal yoga or pregnancy yoga, light Pilates, you can try some, um, you know, elliptical, swimming is wonderful, but no high intensity training, no hit training, definitely no boot camp training, that is a hard no. So we got a response from our ERA video the other day. Uh-huh question is, uh, your ERA is that an ERA can actually increase the chances of a miscarriage. Can you yep. explain? So if you're doing an ERA test, the problem with an ERA test is that the ERA test can offset when the embryo is supposed to go in there. And if you put the embryo in at the wrong time, it can actually increase the risk of miscarriage because you may 
have asynchrony between your embryo and your uterine lining. So that's the theory behind why the ERA may not be beneficial and can even increase uh, miscarriage risk. Now, the actual research they did themselves showed that it may increase miscarriage risk. We don't know why. Part of the problem with all those studies is they're not segregating day five embryos versus day six embryos. And there is data, which we reviewed on the show a few weeks ago, which shows that a day six embryo should go in after six days of progesterone and day five embryo should go in after five. So, or six, actually, it doesn't make a difference. So um, they're not looking at that with ERA. ERA, even by their own study, demonstrates that it does not work. Do not invest your money in an ERA test. It is not worth it. What is your preferred treatment method for endometriosis, or Lissa, Lupron, or something else? Um, I'm a big believer in individualizing patient care. So I think it really depends on each patient. There are certain patients that benefit from Orlissa because it's a little bit more gentle than taking Lupron, does not have quite the same side effects or um, the intensity of the side effects, shall we say. Vizan is way more gentle, but some women get headaches, so it's not great if you are a woman that has headaches or migraine headaches. In particular, if you get vascular headaches, hormonal ones, you definitely don't want to be on Vizan. Um, Lupron can work very, very well, uh, but then you got to be willing to tolerate the side effects, which are all the side effects of menopause. Hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, vaginal dryness, sleep disturbance, decreased sex drive. So there's a whole slew of them that come along with that. Um, and, you know, obviously you don't want to have to go through that if you don't have to go through that. So you should be individualized. There's no question Lupron is sort of the gold standard. It's the one that's got the most data. Um, we know that it works exceptionally well, but there are other options and they should be considered. And head-to-head um, -head trials of Vizan and or Alyssa against Lupron show that there is no significant difference between the two. Um, they were what they call non-inferior, so they trialed them and said they're not worse than taking Lupron or um, uh, anything like Lupron. Uh, they didn't show that they're better, but they certainly didn't show that they're worse, so you can use either yeah. one. Let me do a Facebook one. I uh, love that you do this every day. Couldn't ask for a better doctor. Thank you for all you do. Uh, thank you. That's very sweet of you to say. Uh, in what circumstances would you suggest transferring to embryos? Val, I don't know what you mean by transferring two embryos. Oh, you mean two embryos. Ah, that was a TO instead of a TWO. Okay, so um, if you are over the age of, let's say, 37 and you have, or 38, and you have not done pre-implantation genetic testing of your embryos, it's pretty reasonable to consider putting in two embryos at a time. Why? Because under those circumstances, we anticipate that at least one of them is likely genetically abnormal, if not even both of them. And so you're probably only dealing with one normal, one abnormal. It's not unreasonable to put in two at a time. However, last year we did a show on two versus one embryo transfer on fertility factor fiction. And that's demonstrated in their study that cumulatively, if you go one at a time, you actually end up with a higher success rate. So there is a cost factor involved in that because it's expensive to come back for individual embryo transfers. But success-wise, they're actually saying individual single embryo transfers are more successful than putting in two at a time. I would tell you that if you have two already frozen together, which unfortunately is the case for many of our embryos from our previous center, or they wouldn't necessarily do exactly what myself or the patients wanted. Um, and you're putting the two embryos, they're already frozen together, put them in together because thawing and then refreezing and then rethawing is not good for an embryo. So it's better to put them both in at the same time and take the risk. Um, also, uh, if you have PGT tested embryos, do not put in two at a time. Um, the study by Schoolcraft showed that there's a huge increase in risk of having twins, and it just does not make sense to do that. You should really only put in one at a time if you know that they're genetically normal. One maybe exception to that, if you're substantially older, or you're in your mid-40s, or you're even in your 50s, and you're still doing fertility treatment, that's a circumstance where it might be, might be I emphasize, reasonable to consider putting in more um, you know, embryos at the same time. 
Would you trust sneak peek test results? If by sneak peek you mean uh, the NIPT testing, I normally trust them, although yesterday someone reached out to me and said their PGT testing had demonstrated a boy and their NIPT testing had demonstrated a girl. So I'm a little confused about that one. Supposedly NIPT testing has a very low error rate, but it can have errors and so can PGTA. So um, normally I'd say it's pretty trustworthy. Um, I know certainly for Down syndrome screening, it's a one in 10,000 error rate. It's 99.9999% accurate. So you gotta look at that. Uh, can inflammation cause a uh, miscarriage? Yes, inflammation can cause a miscarriage for sure because overactivation of your immune system can certainly lead to uh, more sort of immune mediated cells in the endometrium. And if they look at the half of your embryo that is not you and don't like what they see, they will try and kill it. Go for it. Um, got a couple here that just came up. But we'll look at some first. How much folic acid do you recommend? Um, ideally five, uh, five milligrams is good. So. Um, take the full five milligram dose. What should HCG levels be around 14 DT, 5 DT? Yeah, 14 days post five day transfer. Um, minimum of like 150, 200 is like what we like to see minimum. Um, so that's a reasonable number. Yeah. Restless legs during pregnancy. Not a lot. Um, calcium and magnesium may help you. Uh, probably best thing you can do is take some melatonin to help you sleep better. Um, don't do anything in your bedroom at night other than sleep and have sex. No Netflix, no on your telephone, no iPad or computer. Don't read in bed. Sleep hygiene is really important to sleeping better. Can supplements help regula regulate your cycles? Yeah. So there is data that shows that inositol and NAC um, can actually help regulate your cycles. Um, just watch our show from last week. We reviewed all of those things and talked about how they impact your menstrual cycle. And that was what they looked at. They looked at menstrual regularity. So just watch last week's show. That's what it was all about. What are the best supplements or remedies for thickening your lining? Uh, aspirin, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin C. Um, Viagra works fairly well, uh, GM CSF can work well, but that's not a supplement, it's a medication. Um, that's probably the majority of the supplements, and then of course estrogen. Um, so those are the main ones. That's all I got. That's you, what you got there? Okay. So I've got a couple here. Let me see what I've got. Um, some more on the other too. Hey doctor, I wanted to ask your opinion on Monistat 3 for yeast infections, the back says ask a doctor if pregnant to use. Go ahead, use it vaginally, um, inside or outside, but do not take Diflucan, the oral pill for treatment of yeast. That's not safe in pregnancy. You shouldn't be using that. Um, you had mentioned I could take progesterone to help with this pregnancy, but haven't heard anything else on it. Should I call and confirm for a prescription or am I not far enough along yet? Nine weeks. Uh, Judy, you can definitely take progesterone. Just call and ask for a script. Um, we're more than happy to put you on the progesterone. Uh, so just call, leave a message with the office and we'll put you on it. I'm a big progesterone believer. I love it. So if you are pregnant and you've had a history of problems, definitely go on the prod. It'll help you quite a bit. Uh, what else have we got? What is the difference between, oh gosh, what is the difference between the vaginal suppository progesterone and oil? Um, okay, so the oil works better. Uh, what you need is a certain level of progesterone in your bloodstream, and then you need a certain level of progesterone in your uterus. So we actually use both, but there are studies from Shady Grove, a fantastic uh, research um, uh, institute and fertility center in the US, which demonstrates that uh, progesterone and oil is better than anything else. So we do stick with progesterone and oil, and most places do. We actually moved away from it for a while, and then I went back to it. Um, so I think it actually is much more uh, significant as an agent than the uh, vaginal only. So we use both. We don't do just uh, one. 
I have IBS. I am sorry you have IBS. I don't know if there's more to that question. Um, IBS has never been shown to impact fertility. So that's uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so if you have IBS, there are medications you can take to help you. Um, uh, and a lot, lots of fiber in your diet will help you as well. Uh, but it doesn't impact fertility as far as we know. Um, so Kayla is just going back to her question about uh, doing NIPT testing. She says, basically, if they find any Y chromosome, then they say boy, and if they don't see any Y at all, they say girl. You do the test at home with a finger prick. Um, oh, wow, I haven't heard of that one. Uh, yeah, I don't know how accurate that is. Um, finding out if it's a boy or a girl is all the rage these days. A simple blood test at uh, any lab it, with 50 bucks now, I think, can tell you by virtue of doing the non-invasive prenatal testing. Um, it's only invasive in that you're getting a blood test, but that's pretty mild. So um, I don't know specifically about that sneak peek test. I don't know why people are so desperate to find out what, what they're having either. Uh, leave it to surprise and see what you get. Um, at what point during an IVF cycle should a woman stop hit? Uh, AKA focus D25, uh, before you start your meds, you should start, stop your hit or very early on into them. Once your ovaries get big enough, especially with focus T25, where you're jumping up and down a lot, you have an ovarian torsion risk. Do not do that. So if your ovary torts, most surgeons will incorrectly remove the ovary because when you go in there, it looks dead. Um, so for God's sakes, if you ever do tort an ovary, make sure your doctor just untorts it. But you don't want to be jumping up and down when you're going through IVF. You could rupture follicles. You could cause release of follicles. It'll hurt like hell. It'll be uncomfortable. So stop before you start your shots. Um, when do you choose natural FET versus medicated? Uh, we like medicated just because the best evidence that I have found so far seems to support programming this cycle. But honestly, every month, there's at least two articles that say medicated is better and two articles that say natural is better. So last month, for example, one week in, a, uh, in advance of two articles, one said, the first one that came out said um, that medicated and unmedicated are the same. And then the next week, an article came out saying that non-medicated had, had less miscarriage, but the success rates were the same. So no one knows yet. There hasn't been a fully done randomized controlled trial where you cover for all the various confounding variables. So we're not 100% sure yet, but um, I like the medicated ones a little bit better, but we do play it by ear and take every patient individually because we know for sure that some patients just don't do well with the medication. Um, for example, last month we had a surrogate who we put through our standard protocol and our lining grew way too thick. Even when we stopped our estrogen, it stayed too thick. Some people just don't respond well, so you have to use less. So for sure there are individualized cases. Um, remember, it's not, you know, I always say the same expression, we're not baking cookies, we're making babies here. So um, this is not cookie cutter medicine. If you are not in a center that's willing to individualize for you, you're not at the right center. Everybody should be dealt with individually. Is it common to have a period when starting estrogen patches for developing a thick lining prior to transfer? My transfer is hopefully the 16th of September. Uh, so you should have a period at the start of the cycle and then once you're on the estrogen patches, it should dwindle. So that's the way it's supposed to work. Um, I got a quick question uh, from Katie. Is melatonin safe in pregnancy? Yes, it's totally safe in pregnancy. You can use it. I have stage three endo. I've had three failed transfers. I'm sorry. Uh, trying to conceive for six years. Do you do intralipids? Yes. Do you think they work? Yes. I do think they work. Also, I have a very large painful cyst on my ovaries. Would that cause any implantation problems? Okay. So first of all, I'm very sorry you're suffering through the endo. Um, if you have an endometrioma, it should be considered for excision. Um, it does do damage to your ovaries, but the larger it gets, the more damage it does. Staying there, removing it does damage, leaving it does damage. That is well established. A lot of fertility centers are very shy about operating on endometriosis because they don't want to harm your ovaries. 
Um, and more importantly, they don't want to lose your business. So they say, oh, if I got to wait a couple of months to do surgery for you, she's going to go somewhere else. Well, the truth is it's better to operate on some, some patients and treat the endo because they get pregnant. I just had a patient today, um, one of my all-time favorite patients and a friend of one of our previous uh, employees here who uh, I, you know, she had years of infertility. She came to see me. Her history clearly indicated she had endometriosis. We managed to get her in for surgery before COVID. Literally a month or two later, she got pregnant. Unfortunately, she suffered a miscarriage. I just saw her again today. She has a live baby in there. Things look great. And she hasn't taken any fertility medications at all. Years of infertility, one surgery, bang, I treated her endo. She's pregnant now twice in a row in a short time period. So um, surgery can be very, very useful for endo. And so it should not always be left uh, behind because fertility specialists want to plow you through the IVF machine. Sometimes it's good to avoid IVF. Uh, and a lot of centers don't want to do that because it's a financial loss. I desperately don't want to have to do something to you you have to pay for. Here in Canada, the surgery is free. If I can operate on you and get you pregnant for free, why would we not do that? That's going to be a great option for you. So you need to look at that because if you have a cyst of endometriosis, it's causing a huge amount of inflammation, and that takes a lot to quell without removing the cyst. Um, those of you who are suffering from endo and going through uh, a, a frozen embryo transfer, um, there are good studies that show that three to six months of Lupron with letrozole will improve your implantation rate and almost normalize it. So that's something to consider. I've always heard that excision is better in the long term than ablation for cleaning up endo. Uh, it's not true. So there's a good study we reviewed, oh gosh, it was a long time ago, probably a year ago, showing that there is a 1% difference in um, outcomes between ablation and excision. So 1% is clinically irrelevant. I mean, that doesn't mean anything. So um, if you're really hell-bent on that extra 1%, sure, have it excised. Keep in mind that excisional surgery um, re requires someone really, really good to be doing the surgery. Not everybody is capable of doing that. Um, so it doesn't always work. I have a request on Instagram to join our show live and be in the video. We actually don't do that because we're on multiple platforms at the same time and no one else would be able to see you. So forgive me for not putting you on live. Um, if you were on iron supplements during pregnancy, do you continue taking them after the baby is born? Yes, because your beautiful brand new baby is an iron leech on your boob and you want to definitely keep on the iron because the baby will suck a lot of iron out of you. Um, so make sure you're staying on that. That's really important. What is the best way to thicken your uterine lining? Uh, estrogen is the best way. Um, but all those other supplements we talked about will help. So things like the vitamins, uh, C, D, and E, um, doing aspirin will help. Um, there's a lot of different ways. We started toying with PRP. It might help. Uh, I'm doing it in a patient with a very thin lining, so we're hoping it'll thicken the lining. Um, so that's uh, very reasonable to do. When is the soonest surgery date for endo? Uh, to all of you watching who are in Ontario and waiting for surgery, my sincere apologies on behalf of all physicians and the hospital. Surgery is never right now. It takes forever to get people in for surgery. Um, it is virtually impossible to get you in for laparoscopy. I have two surgical days this month. I used to have four or five per month. Um, and then I probably won't get any for another six weeks after that. So. It's a nightmare. Um, do not hold your breath if you're trying to get surgical treatment for endo anywhere. It's super hard to get in. And I, again, I apologize, it has nothing to do with us. Um, okay, uh, Randy, I'm looking forward to seeing you too. Randy just says that she's gonna be seeing us soon. A bit off topic, but being such a great doctor, you must receive some sentimental gifts from clients after growing some through some, uh, so much together. Do you hold on to these gifts? Do you have a special way that you display them? So right over here is an entire uh, cabinet, which I won't try and show you because it would require rotating stuff. But I have all sorts of gifts there. I've got a, I'll show you the mug. Can you grab me the mug? Yeah. The mug is great. 
I got a couple of pictures, so we love the pictures. And um, someone bought me this, so it says Dr. Victory on one side. And then it, on the other side, it says, I uh, never dreamed I would be a super cool OBGYN, but here I am killing it. I did not make this, but a patient bought it for me. So I love stuff like this. Little kitschy things like that are awesome. Um, someone baked me cookies yesterday because we got her pregnant as well. The cookies are right there. We got all sorts of stuff. So yeah, I love the little gifts. Um, we're not allowed to accept any major gifts, so food's fine. It disappears. The college probably won't get mad at us for eating some brownies or cookies. Um, and most of you that know me know that I love brownies and cookies. But uh, yeah, we keep almost every single gift. Even a lot of the cards we keep. I think my wife has stockpiled all the cards people give us. And uh, we love that. So yes, thank you. Having said that, totally unnecessary. We treat everyone equally. Um, gifts are not going to get you any better or worse treatment. Um, we love you all equally and we'll always do the same for everyone. Um, okay. Uh, I apologize in advance if you've already asked answered this question. But in your clinical experience, is crinone as effective as PIO? No, uh, crinone is excellent and I love crinone. It is not as effective as PIO. So PIO is better. Um, here is a really good one from uh, YouTube. What's the difference between Clomid and Letrozole? Uh, how would you decide which to give a patient with PCOS to stimulate ovulation? Does one have better results or less side effects than the other? So. Uh, they do work a little bit differently uh, in terms of their chemical composition and how they get the brain to respond. Um, but they ultimately have the same effect, which is trying to get the brain to um, send out more signal to stimulate your ovaries to produce an egg. In a head-to-head -head trial published um, in the New England Journal of Medicine by an author named Legro, uh, last name is Legro, L-E-G-R-O, if you want to look it up, they compared Clomid versus Letrozole over six months. The live birth rate was 27.5% after six months of Letrozole use, but only 19.1% with Clomid use. So Letrozole became the de facto first line agent for all patients with PCOS. So if you have PCOS, you should always start with Letrozole. If you are failing to respond to letrozole, you can go up the scale of dosage up to a maximum of 10 milligrams. The supplements help, so inositol, NAC, stuff like that. You must, especially if you're in the heavy PCOS category, you must exercise, you must lose weight, you must diet appropriately, keep your calories low, high protein diet, low carbohydrates. You must exercise, walking is not exercise, we say that on virtually every show. Um, and then use the letrozole. It will eventually work. It has about a 93 to 96% ovulation rate. Um, having said that, in some patients it doesn't, and if it doesn't, you can go to Clomid. I do know of some patients that have used both at the same time, Clomid and letrozole. We haven't done that, although there's one patient we're gonna try it on because she's not responding. So uh, I think that that's a reasonable thing to consider, but generally speaking, you should always start with letrozole first it's the right one out of the two agents. Um, are there any diagnostic surgical procedures that can be done at CREATE in Toronto? Hysteroscopy, yes. Laparoscopy, no. I am considering buying two millimeter laparoscopic instruments, which are super tiny, um, including the camera and the instrumentation, so that we can do laparoscopy here in the office under conscious sedation. The problem with it is A, cost, it's astronomical. We'd have to charge a lot to the patients. And B, uh, the problem with it is you can't treat. So if I get in there and I see you have endo, I can't treat your endo with two millimeter laparoscopic instruments. There's literally no way to do it. So I'd go in there, look around go, oh, you have endo, now I gotta repeat the surgery all over again a few months later, um, or at this stage, maybe even a year later in the OR. So um, that's not gonna help. Uh, can supplements help to regulate cycles? Yes, we talked about that a moment ago. I've had four failed transfers. Oh, I'm so sorry, and never normal periods. I took a break this year, started some supplements, metformin, and I'm starting to cycle every 32, 35 days. So as long as they are ovulatory cycles, that's fine. So 
Uh, make sure you're ovulating. If you're just having a period every 32, 35 days, it does not mean you're ovulating. You've got to make sure you're ovulating. So either have the physicians check you, measure your LH levels, your progesterone levels, or um, check with an ovulation predictor kit. But don't just uh, don't just take it um, and then anticipate that you are just because of the cycle regularity, you actually have to confirm that you're ovulatory. Supplements do help. Um, there's no question that inositol and NAC will regulate your cycles, probably help reduce inflammation. My opinion on fasting while taking metformin, um, it'll probably upset the hell out of your stomach. I would avoid that the day you're fasting, skip your metformin. Uh, it stopped recording. <clears throat> um, can intramural... Fibroids around two centimeters hinder implantation or cause miscarriages. Fibroids do not hinder implantation or cause miscarriages unless they're bigger than four centimeters intramural or deflecting the inside of the cavity. So if they're only two centimeters, they're not doing anything to the cavity, you don't need to worry about them. Uh, how are the side effects for each one? This is uh, live, live, love, fearless. Um, the letrozole clomid question, would it be hard to start either at the same time as starting a new job? Uh, right, so letrozole has very few side effects. Um, I normally tell the husbands to uh, wear Kevlar if their wife or partner is taking um, uh, clomid, or even if it's a wife and a woman who's taking clomid. Um, you need to be careful. It can make you extremely moody. Some women get hot flashes. I've even had women with significant visual disturbances. So letrozole has way fewer side effects. You can definitely tolerate it while starting a new job. I'm not sure I'd be taking Clomid if I was starting a new job. That can be a bit of a problem. So uh, you got to be a little bit more cautious when starting that one. Um, and to those of you who have taken the Clomid, um, you're total warriors, so thank you for enduring everything you have to go to. You know, it goes without saying, um, you know, I will give a shout out to all the guys out there who go through the fertility journey, especially if you have male factor. It's it's a difficult journey. But for all the women who have to take the shots and have to take the meds and have to wait until they're pregnant and, you know, progesterone and oil injections and all the, you know, uh, Wanda ultrasounds up the wazoo, like it's... You know, I my heart goes out to you. You guys are all amazing. I have nothing but respect and admiration for all of you. You're all amazing people. Um, enduring what you have to endure just so that you can create a family for you and your partner, whether it's male or female, is a phenomenal, phenomenal gesture of sacrifice, of love, of compassion, of tolerance, of patience, um, and knowing how frustrating it can be, the highs and the lows, uh, I'm just constantly in awe of what you guys go through. So you're incredible for that. And uh, um, I, I respect you. Yeah, amazing, amazing. So thank you for all that you do. Um, it makes my job a true pleasure to see that I get to be part of that and help such incredible people and, and meet such incredible people too. I think we're out of questions. Do you have any there? Uh, I'm just looking on one more. I think that's it. Uh, you don't have much time, but do you, tr do you treat OEOBSs? No, you're good. We're good. We're done. All right, guys. Uh, we've only got two minutes left anyway. So, listen, we would love to hear from you in terms of topics that you would like to hear about. Am I open to working with naturopathic doctors for collaborative care? Uh, I have a naturopathic doctor, Dr. Jennifer Strong, um, in our Windsor location. And in Sarnia, we actually have people call in to hear um, we are opening up some new locations as well in the next little while. So I'll be finding uh, probably some local people for that as well. So yeah, we're totally open to it. I'm a strong believer in it. I think it's great. Gotta have a good naturopath though. Um, Jen Strong is amazing. We love her. So if you have questions, she'll happily do a Zoom consult for you. All right, guys, one minute left. Uh, lots of love. Send out any questions you have. Uh, make sure you give us some topics to talk about. Uh, thanks again for joining us on Fertility Factor Fiction. Hope you enjoyed the show. Watch the YouTube channel. Um, we want to get thousands and thousands of views. Tell everybody, and uh, hopefully we'll make it something big and wonderful. Take care, guys. Have a good night. Bye now.